All right. Dave, Chris, hello. I can't, uh, I don't see it. Ah, there we are. Good evening and hello, everybody, and welcome to the December meetup of Austin AIoT. Uh, we're doing something a little different this month. We're doing it online on our YouTube channel, as you all know. Uh, this meetup will also be uh, preserved. I can't, uh, I don't see it. Ah, oh, there we are. Will be preserved on the YouTube channel for future viewing. Uh, we're doing something a little different this month. Excuse me one moment. Online on our YouTube channel, as you all know. Uh, this meetup will also be. Uh, I have to turn off my speaker here. Will be preserved on you. Yeah, there. there we go. Growing. Sorry here. about that. Uh, as I was saying, our meetup will be uh, preserved on the YouTube channel for future viewing. And uh, I really don't have a lot of uh, introductory stuff this month, so without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Thompson for his presentation on LoRaWAN. Take it away, Chris. Thank you, Chris. All right. I hope you can hear me pretty good. Thanks for getting us set up here, Dave and Darren, in the back office there. A um, little more audio feeding in. Just turn him off. He doesn't want to talk anyways. <laughs> okay, so um, I have had an opportunity over many years of working on communication systems to work on numerous things from uh, telephone systems to routers to firewalls. And most recently, I've had the opportunity to get to know the LoRaWAN technologies, working with a couple of different customers in the last few years. Um, so, yeah, I just getting the echo, the sounds coming back again to me. Do you hear the, the long delayed? Might be my own mic. Uh, yeah. I don't know if that was me. Did you fix that? Okay. Okay, so I lost my YouTube feed, but I don't need it. So um, let's see. Uh, the the I've had the opportunity of meeting Dave uh, in the past while working on some of these LoRaWAN projects. So. As I got to know the technology a little further, I thought I'd take the opportunity to present my knowledge. And this is designed to be a somewhat casual um, presentation. There's a lot of content here. Uh, there are no warranties on the content I've provided. Uh, but the intention is if you want to start experimenting with LoRa using end nodes or gateways or uh, different types of network servers and application servers, then this should give you a pretty good leg up and get started at this. So I'm going to document my, um, uh, uh, I have documented my project in WordPress. So it's as easy as possible to share the content with my clients. Right now, that includes a number of uh, university programs trying to bring students up to speed on these numerous technologies. So to state that, uh, we want to try to keep things simple. It's kind of difficult in a modern world of telecommunications. Um, the There are a lot of complexities. And one of the best ways to achieve what we're after is try to embrace those complexities, thereby hopefully allowing us to enable simplicity. In other words, perhaps we might want to start with some documentation. So that's what we get to here. We're going to pack up for our trip. Uh, with different kinds of devices. Four major components of LoRaWAN are the end nodes, the radio frequency gateways, the network server, and the application server. In this case, we're going to be using 
EveryNet and SEMTOR for our network server and our application server. We have a few different gateways available um, and we'll look at those a little further. Uh, as you see in this diagram, there is an end node. Oops, hold on a second. Let me get my mouse turned on. Okay, I'm using a Santa Claus theme today. Um, I'm not sharing my screen. Oops. Okay. Um, so you can. Okay, good. So here's the four com major components of our LoRaWAN portion of the system, which is the end node will be broadcasting to gateways, which might be hopefully are in reach. Uh, if the gateways do hear a valid LoRaWAN frame, they're going to forward it off to the network server. The network server has a few tasks like controlling the radios on both the end nodes and the gateways, doing du deduplication, uh, allowing for devices to join the network, uh, dealing with things like network addresses that are assigned, uh, and then forwarding the payload to the application server itself. The application server is really a gateway to actual application, um, ac actual applications. So a number of uh, clients I talked to felt the job was largely to get uh, the content to SEMTOR. Well, actually SEMTOR, in this case, our application server, is really just a transfer point where the content, the payload is uh, decrypted, but also decoded. So we can figure out the, what the temperature was, what the humidity was, what the battery's at. But that data still needs to be sent off somewhere for uh, consumption. So I developed some uh, capabilities on my own using an MQTT broker from HiveMQ, it's a, a public MQTT broker, using Node-RED and Influx uh, to store that data. And then I've written some Django application, a Django application that lets me start to get at the, uh, the, the data logs so I can look for things like gaps in frames received, um, what's uh, RSSI, what signal strengths things are being received at, et cetera. So, as we jump in here, my background is I'm a, a network engineer. I was licensed as a, a, prof a professional engineer in Ontario before I moved down to Austin, Texas, back in 1990, where I live now. Um, I do have a Cisco CCIE. I don't keep it uh, current, but my uh, interest is in these field applications and network operations. So hopefully you'll feel that come through as we go through this content. There's no sales pitch in today's presentation, other than um, if you're looking, if you have LoRaWAN projects I can help with, let me know, because I want to do more of this stuff. So let's uh, jump back in to, uh, what is the Amazon side box for? Um, don't know. Um, I'll get back to that. The, the, um, the stack, as you might look at it, that LoRaWAN uses includes, as you can see here, different types of regional bands in use in Europe and uh, Asia and uh, the USA, for example, different frequencies, different rule sets that are required. And then those are used with the modulation techniques of LoRa. Uh, and um, you have different kinds of, which include things like how long does it take to transfer a symbol, um, various mechanisms within the LoRa modulation mechanisms that uh, allow for data to be received well below the signal to noise floor uh, at the cost of low bandwidth. Uh, several kinds of devices are available. Largely, this is about whether or not they're willing to listen to downlinks or how much downlink they can take, how much listening they do. So class A, B, and C. Um, most of my experience, all of my experiences with class A devices. There are Mac options, which is a critical part of any layer two of uh, uh, OSI network, which is the ability to control who can get on to the network and use the network. So media access control. Finally, above all of that stack sits our actual application data, as you see here in green. So we want to look at these, the, the path of these packets as the packets transfer from the device to the customer. So let's go to this little tab over here where it's zoomed up and you can see there are end devices that might be using LoRa, like a pet collar or some kind of weird pipe and whatever that is, that will transmit their radio frequency chirps 
transmissions on a channel of radio frequency, typically 125 kilohertz, sometimes 500 kilohertz wide. Uh, the gateways, multiple gateways may hear that transmission. The transmission is transferred across to the LoRa uh, server, network server. It technically may or may not be secured at that point. It is legitimate to forward that traffic over just plain old UDP as well. Uh, as the content within uh, the payload itself is secured. The supporting the LoRaWAN server is a join server, which has information that's provided typically by the application server to define which devices are allowed to join the network. So they will have some critical information such as endpoint identifier and uh, network uh, uh, application key. So let's go back to the trip report. Um, one of the key jobs of those network servers as well is to deduplicate the packet, the frames. So if two different gateways hear a LoRaWAN frame, then the LoRa uh, network server will deduplicate them and only send one up to the application server. Uh, it's important to note again that the application server definitely can decrypt the data. It may also decode the data, figure out what in the payload is a temperature, what's a humidity. So decoding separate from decrypting but it doesn't store the data. So you still need to find a place to go put the data. So as we're now preparing for the trip, let's look at that trip a little bit more. Uh, with yet another rendering of what a LoRaWAN network looks like. So you can see that the application data is going into a pipe, perhaps in the house, it's reading uh, a meter or, or such electricity consumption. Uh, a piece of data goes out inside the LoRaWAN radio physical layer, the LoRaWAN gateway, We'll pick that up and forward it over an IP backhaul using a protocol known as packet forwarder, very complex name, uh, where it will arrive at a network server. The network server then has the job of forwarding it off to an application server where it can actually enable those applications for things like smart parking and agriculture. So now we got a little idea of what our, our journey looks like. We got a radio frequency component. We got a trip across to the network server. We got to get up to the application server and then finally off to an application itself so someone can do something with it. So as we prepare for the trip, the questions are, what type of, what are your sensors? Are you measuring turbidity? Are you measuring in water flow? Are you measuring temperature, electricity consumption? Uh, how are the sensors attached? Uh, can you buy uh, an end node that already does that? Are you in an alpha or beta stage? Are you trying to look for a production type of a product? Um, is your sensor, your end nodes, do they need to be indoor or outdoor? What temperature range do they need to be able to work at? Uh, are you going to have a small helical uh, you know, coil type antenna or a, a larger antenna? Is it going to have to work off a battery? How big is this battery? Is there going to be any solar available to back it up? I've seen even uh, devices that can generate electricity off vibration that might be able to help to keep that uh, sensor that end node reporting so we're trying to take a bit of a christmas uh, theme here so the elf workshops group has chosen to use the adafruit feather with uh laura that's a has a hope rfm 95 chip on it i believe and we are using the the laura wan mac in c library so i don't have a lot of background programming in c plus plus or c in, in uh, programming firmware onto uh development boards like the one you see here on the right but uh, I had to learn how to do it. I got through it. There's lots of examples on the internet. Uh, get to know the protocol. Give the timing to the EndNode uh, libraries because LoRaWAN is very timing uh, intensive. And then finally, um, I was able to get data coming out of these uh, Adafruits. So we'll get a little bit more into the those in a, a bit here. More of the planning. Uh, the one very important task, especially in the USA, is to document what your radio frequency plan is. The um, uh, to document what the, the 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 US gateways have 64 of 125 kilohertz channels, but most gateways the the US uh, uh, regional parameters allow for 64 different. Uh, frequencies, but only typically eight will be listened to. So you want to know for your deployment, which subband, which channels will you be using what, on your gateways so that the network server can inform the end nodes to use the same channels. So 
in the case of every net, it was a little convoluted because they had four channels from the first subband and four channels from the second. And uh, once you wrap your head around it, it kind of looks like you see in the diagram there where there's only four valid uplink channels, sorry, eight valid uplink channels plus the 500 kilohertz channel you see overlaid as well. <clears throat> you also should have some idea of how much power your, your sensors are going to be able to transmit with. They're typically not transmitting as hard as your, uh, um, your, your gateways. And what the RSSI receives signal strength indicator sensitivity is for your gateway and your endnotes, because this packet has to transmit and receive. Uh, we'll get a little bit more into this as well. We'll talk about coverage areas and how you can model those using some tools that are available. Uh, with the LoRaWAN infrastructure, it's critical to understand that you can completely outsource that LoRaWAN infrastructure. You can use the Things Network, or you could use ChirpStack. Um, the uh, ChirpStack is formerly known as the LoRa server, and the Things Network you probably have heard of. It's a public uh, LoRaWAN deployment. I could show you that there's one gateway deployed out of my house. There's about seven more in the city of Austin, so you don't even need to have your own gateway. You can put your gateway up and allow other people to transfer traffic through it. Um, you need to plan for data collection, storage, and analysis. So we came up with this mechanism of using HiveMQ as a free MQTT broker on the interim. Uh, we've also deployed with, MQ, with Mosquito for a private MQTT broker. We're using Node-RED to get the data from the MQTT broker and into an influx database where that data can be consumed. Uh, in my case, I'm more of an operational historian looking at the performance of the radio frequency uh, transmissions. So there we are. We're, we're ready for delivery. Uh, I've got a couple other gateways that I use around here, which is the, like the Gemtech Femto. I have a, a Rack 2287, which runs on a Raspberry Pi 3B+. Plus. It's not particularly cheap by the time you buy that card and its hat. Um, the, let's, let's take a look at the questions that have come in. That's the introduction, introductory content. The key here to keep in mind here, as I've captured in the bottom right, is we can think of what's gonna fuel our trip as being the knowledge that we're developing, but we need to understand it in order to turn this into a powerful system. So, let's see, Dave has some questions. Montego systems, at what point in the trip is the communications translated into standard IP communications protocol? Uh, is that Montego asked the question or? Okay, so Montego, uh, the, it's not translated. So let's, let's, let's go to the documentation section of the website that I've developed. So here I developed uh, more intensive uh, uh, chapters on each of these major areas. Let's look at your question, which is under architecture. So the, lots of diagrams here. Okay, this is where the traffic is put inside of an IP packet. Uh, it calls it TCP IP, technically it could be UDP. That's just a moniker. Most backhauls will use SSL, some type of a VPN to protect their backhaul between the gateway and the network server. So the uh, I have some content deeper in this slide here. Let's see here. No, I guess not. On the gateway slide. So when the gateway receives the frame, it pretty much takes the data, the frame it receives and forwards it up to the server encapsulated. So I wouldn't say it translates it. I would say that it's an encapsulation of the LoRaWAN frame. The gateway adds to the LoRaWAN frame uh, a significant bit of gateway metadata as has been documented here. This is straight out of the read, out of the uh, Semtech documentation for their packet forwarder. And here's an example of the type of additional data that goes up to the um, uh, network server. So along with an application payload. So there is no translation 
into standard IP, it's just a tr uh, tunneling. The network server will then forward the payload onto, let's go back to architecture. Yeah. Okay. So there is a distinct uh, secu network secure uh, network layer key between the end nodes and the gate uh, network server. There's also a distinct uh, secure payload that goes between the end node and the application server. So the uh, network server can have encrypted confidential communications with the end nodes to help program their radio frequency uh, channel power and spreading factors while the application data cannot be seen by the network server so the application data is still going end to end all the way to the application server where depending on the application server you're using they may give you raw dec uh, decrypted data or they may give you uh, decrypted and decoded data so I think that pretty much answers that question, right? Okay, so let's take a look at this, this content that I've put together for the purposes of our presentation today. I'm not sure how much um, over there's, you know, it's basically a lot of what I've already covered in summary to begin with. This is getting a little bit deeper into it. So let's look at some of the types of, you know, ways that we're viewing the applications ahead. The IEEE's put out this fantastic slide, for example, showing us all these smart things that we can do, all the way, all the things that can be done, potentially types of uh, verticals that could be enabled by, and applications that could be enabled by LoRaWAN or other types of connected data. So as we try to move towards intelligence, the first aspect is to get that. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. So that's great. I'm getting heckled in the back end. I love it. I need that. So, uh, Dave, that way you can keep me on target. So, this slide is fantastic just to give you all those ideas. Like, as we're looking for ways to generate either, you know, customer value or, um, uh, uh, you know, viable applications, you can look at a slide like this and think about all the ways that you might be able to help improve your city by or, or you know your farm by connecting things to the internet bringing the data back to the cloud so um we've talked about the main components end nodes gateways network servers application servers and finally you better store that data somewhere that's one of the reasons i prefer this slide here is it shows not just the LoRaWAN components but also that if you don't get that data to a dashboard there's really not a lot of value um again this is an overview slide so we've seen a lot of it it's just refresh yep it's refreshing you know the main components typically the folks like ourselves who are diy diy will typically start with an arduino style product like the radio fruit from adafruit it's about 35 bucks uh i'm using both uh, arduino and vs code to program and uh, the the Adafruit endnotes. Okay, so let's let's look at the overall reference diagram I've come up with here for my client and myself, and I'll look at these questions. Uh, the presentation is available because I've written it all directly into WordPress. So just go to AustinVoiceData.com and click on Projects or uh, there's one post, which is like the intro, which I showed earlier. And then I think I have a seven page cluster of, uh, of WordPress articles right now. And I'm happy to share that with anyone. Uh, LoRaWAN is, is not one way you can send commands from, uh, Zhu Yun um, uh, has asked if um, you can send devices from the consumer to the end device. Yes, there is a downlink and most of the systems, the application servers you work with will give you the ability to send a downlink to a device. So you can do things like, like send instructions, like you should 
report every 30 minutes instead of every 60. Or um, I, I can't tell you what other <laughs> examples of other types of downlinks, but usually they're very small frames. There's there's only a very short period during what the LoRaWAN device listens for traffic. There's a receive window. Uh, I think there's a receive one and a receive two. And by default, it only listens on receive two at two seconds after it transmitted. The idea is to turn those radios off as quick as you can so that your battery is extended as long as you can. But yes, there is a minimal downlink capability. Dave, do you have another question? <laughs> okay. Um, so, let's see, Modigo Systems, uh, again, you can contact me directly or anybody at kris at austinvoicedata.com. And I'd be more than glad to help get, help you get access to this content. So let's look at this very busy slide. So I'm a, I'm, as, a, as a, a generalizing specialist and a, and a systems engineer, um, I don't know how we can document things in paragraph form like they taught us in high school. And this is from the son of an English professor. So um, the, I like to start now most projects with a good diagram and then i find that the amount of actual writing that's required um, is uh much lower so let's look at this diagram and you can see over here on the left there's something that's green that's because it's got data down at the bottom there's two different uh repositories where we're going to try to get that data to one is for ubidots which i put together for colorado state university who uses that for their micro meteorology project for soil monitoring, soil moisture monitoring. That's who I did the original Adafruit development work for. And uh, the uh, one on the left is what I put together for my own purposes so that I can see that uh, operational data that tells me, you know, am I missing frames? Am I, uh, what are my spreading factors? What are my frequencies? Uh, what are my RSSIs and what are my signal noise ratios? So, and I'll show you that in a minute because I've written that Django app. I'm very excited about the Django app because I spent much time learning Ruby on Rails in the past and Django seems to pretty much be Python on Rails. Um, so I was very comfortable programming in that environment again and trying to get value out of the data. So if you look at this diagram, the, the blue stuff in the center, the LoRaWAN gateway, the LoRaWAN server can readily be outsourced. In our case, initial project, Exonus, who has the SEMTOR server, application server I'm working with. Um, okay, that's very distracting. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, they outsourced initially for the Colorado State University project, the uh, LoRaWAN uh, radio access network and the LoRaWAN network server to a company called EveryNet. They are a global company, uh, I think, with very strong presence in Europe, uh, South America, uh, all over the world. And they have, from what I can tell, uh, excellent um, uh, user interface provided to their network server that allows me to get at the data I need to see whether the net, not the, de the device is joining and sending data, which is really our first line of defense. When we're trying to get that radio fruit let's say online there's not much to see on the LoRaWAN gateway you might be able to see some packets are being forwarded through it but you really can see decoded data at the LoRaWAN network server you should see the joins the join request showing up there you should see uplinks showing up there even if you can't see what's inside the application payload so with SEMTOR in the center here its job is to provide largely device management onboarding new devices or provisioning of for devices and uh, decoding the de uh, sorry decrypting and decoding the data so let's say data mediation so that's what we're showing in the bottom half here the data gets decrypted it also gets decoded uh, because exonus gave me a, a, a byte packing format they wanted me to use to build um, payloads payloads need to be small um, the uh, the larger the payload, the 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 less uh, you can you can only transmit for four, up to 400 milliseconds. So if you have a broader 
a lot longer distance and you're using a, a higher spreading factor, which we'll get to, um, then uh, you can't get all the data across. So the, you want to get those uh, the payload size down. So you want to pack your bytes, which means you might use half a byte for the identification of a of a sensor, half a byte for the type of the sensor, and then a byte or two for the value of the sensor. And I can show that data here as well. Uh, that's the decoding part. There's also some public decoding engines, I believe, like Cayman that are often in use. Uh, you want to make sure that you are encoding the data on the end node and decoding the data as it pops out. So if you use something like a Tectelic home sensor, for example, they're already encoding the data. You can do a quick look on the internet and find uh, some code that will decode that Tectelic smart sensor for you. Finally, uh, that data gets pushed to an application. In my case, I'm pushing it out to HiveMQ or to a private MQTT broker that UBIDOT stood up uh, at, I think, 100 bucks a month, a bit steep. The customer would have been better off just putting a free, sorry, uh, uh, an open source mosquito or something in place, probably. But then, um, you know, the customer needs to be willing to take that on since he's working with UBIDOTs already. This is just all part of one package at UBIDOTs. Uh, UBIDOT stores the data. UBIDOTs also, when it uses a private MQTT broker or uh, any data that's arriving at the UBIDOT system can go through a private uh, Python function at the front end to transform that data so it's properly formatted for UBIDOTs. And then UBIDOTs has a pretty neat dashboard that allows you to get at things, get at uh, you know quick graphs and quick gauges that allow you to uh, have a simple uh, time to market, a short time to market as far as getting a useful application out in front of end users, application users. So what's the maximum, yeah, what's the maximum range from the end node to the gateway? I believe the world record might be 700 kilometers. Um, more, uh, that might be up on a balloon somewhere. <laughs> I don't know how they achieve that. Um, the more realistic is, uh, uh, it, it depends. Uh, I, I was working with Tectelic yesterday and we were doing radio coverage maps and his radio coverage map in the middle of Lethbridge, Alberta was pretty impressive, you know, uh, 10, 20 kilometers maybe. Um, but when I try to do a radio coverage map in the middle of the mountains of New Mexico, you don't get that same advantage. So uh, I think that we, you might want to think of, you know, 10 kilometers as being a max and I wouldn't be quoted on any of that. There's plenty of content out on the internet for that. Uh, buildings, uh, having sensors inside of buildings, that are trying to get to gateways outside of buildings is uh, uh, rather problematic. So these types of distances are really for line of sight, Fresnel zone free type stuff. Uh, uh, Metro area LoRaWAN networks are available. I well, I don't know if uh, what's available to be perfectly honest. Uh, my I'm a practitioner here working on the internals. And I don't really know who has made uh, public LoRaWAN available yet but I'd be glad to help find out. Okay, so let's leave this. And we're gonna to go to the architecture and protocol page. And Dave or Darren, any feedback so far? Is the pace going okay? Is it too hurdly jurdly? Whatever the word is. Okay. Okay, so we've talked about the path of the packet and we've seen a few different diagrams so far. The LoRa Alliance is an industry association created in 2015 to support LoRa WAN protocol and to ensure interoperability. So that's just a quote straight out of Wikipedia, probably straight from the LoRa WAN Alliance themselves. Um, Semtech is the source of the chips themselves. The chips come in a couple of different varieties. Some that are designed as transceivers, one channel at a time. Some that are designed for gateways listening to eight channels or more at a time. Uh, and there's some good content out on the internet for that as well. We've talked about the protocol stack. Okay, frequency bands. This is where we have a lot of no fun. In the USA, there's 64 125K uplinks and eight 500K uplinks. You can see the way they show it here as 
the gray 500K uplink is in the same uh, frequency space that uh, the first eight channels use. So they're overlapping channels between used for uplink between 125s and 500 kilohertz channels. Um, but that's a lot of capacity. You don't typically see gateways with 64 uh, channels capable. If you do have a gateway with greater than 50 channels in operation, it allows you to transmit at a higher power, I believe. And that's straight from Tech Telic yesterday as well. I think I found that in the spec. Um, otherwise, you're typically going to be listening in either eight or 16 channels total for a gateway. The downlink channels are happening, you know, a, a, a fair bit higher in that same frequency spectrum, you know, starting at 923, uh, whereas the downlinks are between 902 and 914 approximately. Uh, the downlinks are uh, always 500 kilohertz. So I'm only looking at USA standards here. Uh, I believe these numbers may or may not be correct. <laughs> I know that 27 dBm is about half a watt. So I, if I recall correctly, isn't 3 dB supposed to double it? So um, this might be wrong, though. I think this might be actually, uh, you can go up to 36 dBm if you have a 64 channel gateway, and it might be 30 dBm for an eight channel gateway. And I pulled this number out because that was the macro gateway from Tectelic that I was looking at. So I've been doing most of my modeling so far with the gateway using uh, 27 dBm or half a watt. Let's see, RF has What type of transmit power do you hope to use on the Hope RF? I have no idea. I haven't done the um, I haven't I haven't done uh, the RF budget analysis for my own devices as I'm largely worried about just simple connectivity and in the house type stuff. So I watched the receive strength strength indication, but I don't know. You know, I put it out in my shed, I put it down in the garden, in the cantina, and see what impact it has. I have a steel roof. There's all sorts of things uh, that affect the ability for the uh, RF transmission from the end node to get heard by the gateway. Um, so, you know, each application is going to be its own bowl of soup. We have a, a customer in uh, Southern Methodist University in Dallas, and they have sensors inside of buildings that they're trying to get to gateways on the outside of parking garages and are seeing fairly sporadic results and pretty low signal strengths that uh, I think it's mostly about you know little devices with antennas that um, aren't aligned well with the gateway and lots of reflection lots of concrete lots of you know just bad signals so you don't get very much distance at all um, as we go back to the channel okay a couple more things to know about the protocols there is no duty cycle regulated by the FCC, which means how much uh, working time can you have? Like a duty cycle on a motor might be 50%, right? You can only have it working 50% of the time, otherwise you better have it, you have to have it turned off the other 50% so it could be cooling. So in the case of a duty cycle for, for LoRaWAN, it's, it's what percentage of the time can I be talking? Uh, the Things Network limits you to 30 seconds a day per device. And if you go over 30 seconds a day per device, and I don't think it takes a whole day to get there, um, they'll start uh, blocking your transmissions. But what we do have to worry about in the US is um, the 400 millisecond max dwell time per channel. So if you want to transmit a large packet, you're going to have to uh, make it smaller than 400 milliseconds uh, for time on air or split it into multiple frames. Okay, so as we look now into this weird thing called the spreading factor, Think of the spreading factor as how long does it take to transmit a bit or a byte, right? More more cycles uh, uh, of the of the channel, more hertz required means it has a higher spreading factor. So as we go from spreading factor seven, which can be received with a a, a negative signal noise ratio of negative seven point five, it has a pretty high bit rate, but a shorter distance of approximately two kilometers, I presume line of sight. Um, as we go down to SF10, you can see that it can get that signal, that signal can be heard at a much lower received signal strength indicator, or also that can be read as a much lower signal to noise ratio. 
a negative signal noise ratio, something that I wasn't familiar with before LoRaWAN. Um, but you can see that the, the, the bits per second that you can transmit is much lower. But at the same time, you can transmit it much farther. So it's basically slowing down your speech so it can be heard further away. Uh, two things you can do to help get that transmission through is you know speak louder and speak slower. So there's a bit of a summary. If you have a higher spreading factor, it allows for a, a lower minimum received signal strength indicator and a lower signal to noise ratio at the cost of a lower data rate and a longer time on air and also higher power consumption because the longer you're transmitting, the faster you're beat, eating up your battery. These numbers are just numbers I pulled from, you know, some source on the internet. Your mileage may will vary. Um, it does give you a sense of how the changing spreading factors affect the distance, the bit rate, and the signal strength required. So at this point, where did I get that content, those numbers from? Uh, I found this fella here at MobileFish. Don't try to go to MobileFish.com. It looks like a mess. But this uh, individual has put out a very large series of uh, LoRaWAN tutorials. So as you want to get into any aspect of LoRaWAN, a uh, good place to go to get some background content. Let's look at what this one's showing us, for example. This is the uh, RF link budget, just as seen on the receiving side. So the the signal strength is decaying fast uh, due to free free space path loss, or whatever they call it. It hits an antenna, which is the green here. So on, on the inbound, on the receive side, it has a gain on that receive antenna. And then it has a a loss again as it gets to the actual receiver chip. Finally, it's at the receiver chip, and you can see at the blue line level here, it's below the noise floor, which is really pretty interesting because you can receive signals and and you know demodulate these LoRaWAN signals that are uh, have a negative signal to noise ratio. So that's what's captured there. Let's look at this fella's um, YouTube tutorials for a second here mobile fish so you can see no no i'm not playing though i'm just i'm just showing uh, the, the intention was just to show you how deep his content is so you know maybe from 1990 but from 2018 sorry but there's a grand total of 51 tutorials here different types of antennae different types of backhauls antenna theory uh, over the air versus activation by personalization. So great background content here. We talked about the lower chips earlier. What's the difference between an SX1276 and an SX and a SX1301? Go watch this tutorial number 18 from uh, this fella at MobileFish. Great content. Let's get back to our presentation. Any other questions, Dave or Darren? Great. It's around about seven. Great. The the uh, this is another very interesting part of the protocol itself, which is that the. Uh, by the way, how many viewers are we sitting at right now on YouTube? My YouTube channel crashed. Oh, really good. So, um, Merry Christmas to the, any new viewers. And uh, by the way, my name is Chris, K-R-I-S, and I was born on Christmas Eve, so tomorrow's my birthday, and I was named after Chris Kringle, hence the hat here. Oh, Dave, we are going to catch up. We'll be catching up. That's amazing. Dave, Dave tells me that he was born on Christmas Day. I keep forgetting you can't be heard. Okay, let, let's look at these max payloads. So there's another way to refer to the spreading factor and the channel bandwidth, and that is the data rate. This is part of the LoRaWAN spec, LoRaWAN regional parameters. So you'll see these terms designed almost to confuse us, but they have a purpose. Data rate zero means it's using a spreading factor of 10, which means it's speaking slow on a 125 kilohertz channel. It's got a 980 bit per second bit rate. Really interesting here is that you can only, um, Oh, my boss, you can only uh, transmit 11 bytes in that data rate. If you try to transmit 50 bytes, because I was told I was I needed to deliver 
uh, 50 byte payload because we have five soil moisture sensors and five soil temperature sensors and three environmental sensors, uh, which turned into a 50 byte payload. Well, the time on error would be well over 400 milliseconds. So it can't be done with that. So I cannot use spreading factor 10 for my device. So that means my distance is going to be limited to the distance that can be supported on spreading factor nine. Um, so also I could deliver that data over data rate four, which is spreading factor eight, which is 500 kilohertz. There must be some way to get spread. I believe there is a spreading factor 10 on data rate 10 if it's using uh, 500 kilohertz. So there is a way to get that 50 byte frame across. I just have to use a wider uplink channel using 500 kilohertz instead of 125. But this is a key thing to watch out for. And if you look at the LoRaWAN spec, it'll actually call that out, that, that uh, max payload size. You really got to not go over that. So one of the parts of LoRaWAN that's interesting to work with is the media access control that you can watch with the uh, network server. It will show commands being sent down from the network server to the end node, telling it to change its transmission power, its channels, its uh, uh, usable spreading factors. So I captured a little bit of the regional parameters here. Uh, so we could look at that. You can see that if I send, if the network server sends a link, at, a link adaptive data rate request to the device and it specifies a channel mask field of seven and then a channel mask of let's say all zeros and a one, what it's doing is it's turning off every single 125 kilohertz channel and then turning on just the one 500 kilohertz channel, channel 64, and then simultaneously a second in the same frame, uh, the, sorry, in, in the same frame, downlink frame from the network server, it will also send channel mask zero and it'll give it a channel mask for the first let's say seven channels so it would be uh 255. so that's a way that the LoRaWAN network server will tell the device because the device typically when it boots up will be trying to transmit on all 64 uplinks and the network server needs to tell it to only transmit on the eight uplinks that actually match the network the, the gateway so it's done through these link adaptive data rate request commands the device will then send an acknowledgement back and we could take a look at that if we have time. At the bottom, of, and that's what they're talking about here is having two uh, contiguous MAC commands, one to turn off all the 125s and then a second one to turn on just the selected 125s. And then yeah, at the bottom here, they're once again saying, watch out, don't go over the max payload size. So that's the architecture and protocols page. And I'd be happy to vamp that up further as it gets uh, used. Uh, another question from the form is, what hardware boards would you recommend for hobbyists to get started with LoRaWAN? Well, I'm gonna recommend the Radio Fruit. I've looked at quite a few of these uh, development boards, but still I'd think that this Adafruit Lora board is probably the simplest to get started with, with the caveat that you gotta have a little bit of soldering um, you think as an electrical engineer and a pinball collector, I'd have decent soldering skills, but soldering onto these little boards makes me nervous because maybe of my past. And so I had a friend solder on some headers for me uh, so I could plug my Adafruit into a, uh, a breadboard. And then you can see in this diagram at the top, which should come up a little bit further down on this page, I have a small antenna. I have a very critical jumper between uh, pin six, I believe, and IO one, which tell basically enables the LoRa radio. If you don't pick up in the documentation that you need this cross jumper, you're going to not be very happy. Uh, another uh, pin is being used to read what actually is a DHT11 or an SHT31, uh, which has powers coming off the rails here. I also have a capacitive soil sensor in my test, which um, also I think it's uh, SDL, SDC, or one of those other protocols is used to read. That's why there's actually no. There's only a single wire coming in here, isn't there? So it's it's a uh, it's a pure analog read, I believe. The SHT11 is a digital 
device, but it's also read over a single wire. So let's look at these end nodes. The one I had my first experience with was this device, which is probably much smaller than you're seeing there. It's the size of a poker chip more so. Um, the device is $44 right now at DigiKey. They got a bunch of them in stock. One of the things I like about this device is you see that little magnet indicator, it looks like a U. You can wave your magnet across this uh, magnet indicator and it will, uh, you'll see a little red LED flash, which means a packet just went up. And then you can go over and see if that packet arrived on your um, MQTT Explorer or wherever it is you're reading your data from. So really helpful for bringing devices on board is to be able to actuate some kind of a sensor read. Uh, with my Tectelic, sorry, with my Adafruit devices like this one, I program them, I put into the header file, the instructions of how often to report. If I report more than every 120 seconds, I'm probably going to get a comment from my developer in France about my duty cycle, um, the, you know, transmitting too much. So, but I haven't worked out the science yet of pressing a button to force an uplink, but that would be, I think, what has been recommended to me. This Adafruit is also much smaller than seen in the diagram here. It's got a, a SAMD style uh, microcontrol unit. It has this much larger uh, Hope RFM 95C chip here. So I would start with this at 33 bucks. You can also start, if you want to avoid the, the breadboard, you can also start with this Tectelic uh, smart sensor, I believe it's called, not home sensor. Okay. Uh, I had to get to know a lot of stuff to get programming at this. And so the pinout boards was a lot of it, getting to know how to read through all this, what what's doing what. You can see in this pinout diagram, it might be a little more clear if I open in a new tab. There's very specific uh, instructions for how to, you know, the LoRaWAN module itself has a set of controls, uh, which, you know, which pins I can read from, which ones are are doing what are all summarized in here, where I plug in my antenna. Uh, pretty capable little board for about 35 bucks. Uh, don't forget you need to get the antenna and some headers to solder on there. Also, I bought a very small optional lipo, lipo battery. I'm getting about a day and a half on that battery. So my friends at the Colorado State University said that that's typical for Adafruit style devices. Um, and uh, that they don't necessarily do power management very well. As I talked more with the folks uh, and looked at their application, uh, it looked like they actually plugged their, uh, what is it, a boron from particle. It has the same form factor as the feather. And they have that on a soil carrier chassis. And that soil carrier chassis actually has a real-time clock and data storage. So they actually turn off the entire microcontroller unit and, and turn the whole thing back on when it's time to transmit. So that helps get their battery consumption down much lower. My initial pass of this project was not about maximizing battery, but I know that's coming up pretty quick here. Uh, I have a fair bit of content here because I was asked to put content together for the students at Colorado State University. I was asked to put uh, almost instructable style content on how to get the con how to get the code into the devices. So we're going to look at that briefly, and then I'd like to show you the Mayfly data logger as well as another potential uh, end node to start with. So I started off using the Arduino IDE. It's pretty low grade, <laughs> but it does work and it does give you a, a, a starting point to know that you're you're working correctly with the Arduino device, the Adafruit type device. Um, you need to install some C++ tools. It's a little convoluted how to figure out how to get that in there for a guy like me. Um, you need to install C++ and Telesense, et cetera, for VS Code. Um, VS Code is also going to need to get those boards defined, uh, you know, the SAMD board. Finally, you need to start loading in the libraries for uh, the SHT31, the, the LoRaWAN Mac and C, the folks I was working with at Colorado State University use running average. So they read a sensor five times in a row. There's not a big delay. I think there's no delay. It just reads it five times because they know that due to some kind of weird heuristics thing, 
they're better off reading it five times and taking an average than reading it one time because they'll probably get some spurious value. Um, I also received a messaging interface library from Exonus, so I could form uh, pack my bytes for the data delivery across LoRa. Um, so again, I kept some notes here largely for myself, for you. Uh, yeah, another question has come in. Um, I, I really don't have knowledge. Magato Systems asked if I can comment on the Amazon Sidewalk LoRaWAN network. Um, I really have no knowledge of the other vendors' products. I really just know my uh, the projects I've been working on, but I'd be more than enthusiastic to get to know um, the Amazon Sidewalk projects and how it how it's leveraging LoRa. Um, you can see here we are using the MCC LoRaWAN Elmic library, easily confused with the MCCI Adafruit LoRaWAN library. So you know, get the right library in there. I think this is a newer version, whereas the Arduino ones are maybe a little uh, abstracted uh, up, or maybe even older. Um, you got a lot of fixing up of paths to do to deal with VS Code. Finally, another look at that breadboard. This time, the graphics not stretched, so it's probably a little bit more readable. Okay. You got to load your firmware in. When I had the joy of loading the firmware into the device, this this project is currently not shared, is not public. I'd be happy to add anybody to it. I'd like to move the scripts I've come up with out of it. Uh, let's see here. The There is a script itself, which I can show you, and there's a header file. So let's take a look at these, GitHub. All right, so if we go to the header, for this is the Exonus messaging interface, for example. So I was told to pack my payloads. So what they've done here is they've defined some structure in a library that I had to learn you know, how these structs work. And they're basically giving you the ability here to do dynamic style. Um, sensors and change the size of your labels let's skip that section and go down to the second section see there's the dynamic transducer which which that top section allows but if i'm using one of their static transducers they're telling me here that if i want to do a um a soil moisture it's going to have a size of two if i want to do a a battery level it's going to have a size of one byte so i better get it into between zero and 255. Um, if I want to send ambient light, I'm going to identify it as zero two. If I want to send a battery level, I'm going to send a type, sorry, I'm going to send my type as a, a zero four. So this gets packed together somewhere here into a, a static transducer report where I put my my sensor ID in four bits, uh, I can scale that power. So I can say this is a, you know, whatever you get, multiply it by 100 or multiply it by 1,000. And then finally, I put the payload itself in. So this is, I'm not sure where my uh, ID is. It must have said, anyways, sensor ID right there. We'll go with it. You get the idea. <clears throat> the other portion here is the feather laura itself we were going to look briefly at the header yeah yeah um i am putting a header on these files because every time i burn a add a fruit a feather laura as i call the project code i don't want to have to modify the script itself so i have the script reading a a header file and the header files where we're going to define if we want to turn on debugs because you have a serial port hooked up where you can define if you have a dht11 otherwise it's going to look for a sht31 or crash if you don't want it to crash just uncomment that if it looks for the dht11 doesn't find it it will not crash freeze whatever uh, glitch um this is the critical stuff though here is is these defines are rather annoying to Define. You'll actually see here that my device ID, my device endpoint user identifier, 
is actually 9876B6000022 63BF. But the code wants it written, uh, provided as a array of hex bytes in little endian order. Same thing here, array of hex bytes in little endian order. And then finally, 16 bytes of app key, but go ahead and send it in big endian order. So pretty easy to mess up this format as you transform between a device endpoint user identifier and its, its hex stack. So I wrote a tool for that. Let's take a quick look. Oh, it'll come up. It'll come up in a second here. Okay. I have an example up here. So there's the header I was showing you. I don't really want to go into the code itself because it's very long and I'd be happy to go through it with anybody especially for quality, especially uh, to try to get some of the, you know, the, the footprint down, like my, my Leonardo, Arduino Leonardo is saying I'm at 100% memory, so I'm going to have to try to, uh, you know, take some stuff out, maybe take out floating point math. So anyways, since, since uh, my friends at Colorado State University said, how do I uh, deploy this? How do I get students to deploy 10 of these? I said, well, let's have a little Python script that reads the hex string, converts it into the dev EUI bytes for us reads the hex string, converts it into the app endpoint identifier for us. And again, reads the uh, app key and reads and converts that into the, the key byte. So if you run this script, it'll ask you for these values and it will spit out the, um, uh, the, the, uh, a copy of the script and a header for you. So each folder will become matched to one physical device. These uh, WI, App UI and app key are used for over the air activation. This app key is used to generate dynamic uh, or transient uh, network and application layer keys. Those keys could be kept for quite a long time. They are derived during the join process. At that same time, the device will also get a, a network address. Uh, it is appropriate that a device, even during power down, when it powers back up, should not need to rejoin. It should store this stuff. My code doesn't do that yet. If I lose power on my feathers, they will lose that data, and then they'll need to rejoin. And when they rejoin, I presume that you know we may lose a fair bit of frame. Frames are lost typically after a join as the device needs to download the channel plan again. So just giving you some of the gremlins here. I was thinking about calling these roadside distractions. So let's see here. Uh, you can use a small electrical wire as an antenna. It'll be just as good as that helical. Yeah, I agree. The, the, the uh, helical antenna is basically just making it shorter than three inches, I guess. <laughs> um, and it's about 33 cents. Let's look at the uh, radio frequency gateways next. So the gateways are a critical building block of the LoRaWAN deployment. There's a high probability you're going to want to find somebody who could put, if you're doing a regional deployment, find someone like an Everynet who can provide you access to gateways uh, on towers as they'll already have relationships with tower providers. If it's a private deployment, you know, you're covering a building, a campus, uh, it's probably straightforward to put up a few of your own gateways. Uh, the gateways range from uh, 200 bucks for the rack 2287 plus pi hat plus pi less than 200 bucks or uh, you know cisco prices for theirs over a thousand um, the tectelic micro and macro gateways are probably at a pretty good price point it's a company out of calgary the Micro gateway, which is indoor, for example, has a SIM slot so it can do backhaul over LTE. It also has a battery backup built into a small unit, uh, somewhere between 300, 400 bucks, I think, for the Tectelic indoor gateway. Um, as we get to know the radio frequency plan, we want to really understand the subbands. So this again is tends to be more of a U.S. issue because a lot of the other countries don't have nearly this many. Subbands. Uh, this diagram I put together to try to break this down, give you an idea of, you know, how this lays out. You can see the frequencies. Let's open this up in a new tab. 
Oh, it's no bigger. Oh, maybe this will make it bigger. Hey. The frequency starting at 902.3 going down to 903.7, that's the first sub band. The second sub band goes from 903.9 to 905.3. Some of the fun you get in the world of programming is kind of like the, uh, the, the numbering system where the number zero gets used often where you don't really want it to be. So when you're programming your, your sub bands, you might need to refer to sub band one as sub band zero. Similar sub band two becomes sub band one. So just keep that in mind. What does it start counting at? Does it start counting at zero? Like a computer likes to, or does it start counting at one, which I think is the actual official sub band number. In the case of the things network, they're going to use sub band number two. 903.9 to 905.3 with that same 500 kilohertz channel at 904.6 overlapping in the same sub band. In the case of uh, Exonus, sorry, in the case of EveryNet, they're only using four channels from the first sub band and four channels from the second sub -chan channel sub band. So it's a uh, so that they are probably protected better against interference in either sub band one or sub band two. I'm not sure why nobody seems to be going after sub bands three through eight yet. But that's you know what your device is trying to transmit on randomly. Every every transmission, an end node is going to transmit on one of these 64 channels, and it's going to be hopping around until it gets instructions from the network server telling it to only transmit on the channels that match the local gateways. Okay, so this is uh, back to normal size. Okay, so there's the idea of how every net is doing it. Right, it has that same diagram. I've dropped out the channels that aren't listening, and this is these are the channels that will work from the end node. But if the um, if the the gateway is only listening on those eight channels, at, well, those nine channels, sixty sorry, eight plus one, eight one twenty five uplinks and a five hundred kilohertz uplink. So this little diagram shows you that the gateway's job has has the job of receiving and transmitting on radio frequency and using IP, probably typically a VPN type of an IP link to backhaul the traffic off over either cellular, wireless, or uh, my preference, ethernet to, uh, to the internet and where it'll find the network server. So let's see here. Uh, can we talk about the term sub gigahertz and what that means? I would assert, assume sub gigahertz means that it's just less than the one gigahertz frequency. So that 900 megahertz frequency used for the industrial scientific and medical band, is that right, ISM, in the USA is sub, sub gigahertz. These frequencies are going to typically transmit better through trees and forests and than, than 2.4 gigahertz does. 2.4 gigahertz hates water, 5 gigahertz hates almost anything. 900 megahertz, I've had pretty good luck uh, using it in Wi-Fi applications through, you know, some amount of forced, uh, better penetration uh, due to the lower frequency. It does require a slightly larger antenna because the, you know, the lower the frequency, the larger the wavelength. But I would assume just sub gigahertz is referring to these ISM bands below one, one gigahertz. Uh, so one of the great joys we've had here is the radio frequency coverage plan. So I've been asked to try to deploy uh, three towers in the mountains of New Mexico so that we can keep track of roaming highland cattle. So I need to, be, I need to build a map for that that lets me see if I put a tower here or there, will there be obstructions? Similar, I thought for the purposes here, I would try to put out a, a uh, coverage map between my house and boats on the lake. So here's my house in the middle of uh, Hudson Bend, for example, and I've used a tool called Radio Mobile to start to create a graph, a map. So Radio Mobile does a, is a PC software. Uh, one of the first things you're going to do is look at the website, say, it kind of reminds me of GeoCities, do I trust it? But it seems like all the professionals still trust Radio Mobile, even though it's old. Uh, it first it asks you to install um, runtime some kind of runtime basic from 2004. That's kind of scary. 
But as it turns out, it runs fine on Windows 10. I think it's just a pretty simple application. And uh, it's a little convoluted to install. I found some uh, tutorials. Yesterday, I had the pleasure of working with uh, uh, Tectelic uh, to look at my models and how I use the tool. I was trying to work on some apps for us this morning and found that I just couldn't get them to render correctly. But I felt that this diagram actually met my needs good enough because anytime I do a coverage map with some kind of a rainbow coming out from each tower, it's still just a guess as to how far away each device is gonna be able to work. It gives you some guidance. So how would if I just use the two kilometer ring as my guidance here to get me started? Like how, if I had a two kilometer range from my tower, it would get me halfway through the lake. So similar to tower two down here in the bottom right, if I had a two kilometer range, it would cover a good part of the big basin here on Lake Travis. But you can see that in order for these two towers to cover the main basin of the lake and the and the curve around Hudson Bend here, I'm gonna to need to get more like a three or four kilometer range from those towers. So the next thing I'm gonna do once this session's over is I'm gonna to try to get my, my um, tool once again doing a nice rainbow map overlaying on top of this picture showing me the uh, expected signal strength. Now, one of the important things of this plan, though, is to see my device has a lower power transmission capability than my gateway. So this vessel out here in the middle of the lake might be able to transmit at a plus 14, whereas the tower can transmit at a plus 27. So a big advantage transmitting from tower to vessel. But I am most interested in those transmissions from vessel to tower. So that's going to probably be the limiting factor. Also, uh, again, I'm trying to get a little handle on the polarization aspects of LoRa. You know, this these antennae, if they're not pointed in the right direction, if they're slightly askew, are probably weakening the signals even further. So, but this, I, I was pretty impressed with uh, radio mobile. I took a crack first at a cloud-based tool to get to know the modeling and then spent the time getting to know the radio mobile as well, where you have a complex set of tasks of defining maps, which is basically the location, defining uh, units, which is basically the locations where your towers are, and systems, which are the types of gateways and end nodes you have. And then finally, you can create these pictures where you say, go get me the topo map and put on contour lines and go get the street maps and put on you know these these radial rings around here so really a fun piece of software uh, i'd be happy to work with anybody to try to get to know this this software better if you have a project that um that could take advantage of it okay so that's radio mobile and that was the one when i asked uh Tectelic said you know use this one and so i looked at some forums and some other posts and some other people have said well why wouldn't you just use this one well it's it's kind of complex to work with and it's hard to move your map around so before I used Radio Mobile, I started with this one here called Cloud RF. Now I thought this was fantastic. This Cloud RF map here is showing me that that Highland cattle map I'm working on. So you can see, for example, over here on Tower Two, there's a, sh a big shadow of non-coverage here on this part of the map, right? Now this this Cloud RF, these signals might be from transmitting from the tower to a uh, a device. So I have to account for the fact that transmitting from the device to the tower is going to be weaker. But it still gives me an idea of where my shadows are. Uh, this is built on an irregular terrain model. Um, I have, you can see up here on the top right, I have different layers I've brought back to make them visible. I can just check boxes. So I have a, I have a, a rendering of the coverage from each of three towers, the timestamp it shows at the front, the network name. Um, I can come back later and like hide and just, you know, go back and modify that map a little bit. So pretty easy to work with. Certainly like scrolling to, to move around on the map, you just scroll in or scroll out, pull left or pull right. So it's a lot easier than radio mobile as far as getting your map in place. Let's see here. But probably what I'll be doing tomorrow, if it wasn't my birthday or, or, or the next day when it's Dave's birthday, I'll be maybe boxing day is uh is trying to figure out can i move these towers just a little bit and get some more coverage for these areas because i think there's grazing areas that are not being covered so that is the benefit of having such a map but the gateways have a lot more going on with them as well they don't just receive radio frequency signals 
they also need to forward these received radio frequency frames, these received LoRaWAN frames, they have to forward these onto the network server. So the LoRaWAN Alliance, sorry, sorry, I should say Semtech put together a generically named packet forwarder and they've documented the protocol and it's at the URL provided here. Um, here's a, a bit of a screenshot for it because I think this got some critical aspects. For one, this is like a SIP phone. You, know, you should be able to put this behind a firewall without any problem. If you are using UDP to uplink your traffic, then return UDP traffic would need to be permitted. So it has to be a firewall at least smart enough to permit return UDP traffic for an established connection. Um, you can also have a static address on that device. Um, the server the server has to have a static address so the client the the gateway knows where the server is i guess i should say a static at least by a name so this shows you a bit of what the upstream protocol looks like straight out of this is straight out of the spec right um push the data up uh tell it the gateway mac send the payload up as a json formatted payload receive back an acknowledgement after that you can keep pro it keeps processing packets i guess just wanted to give you that the, the idea that there was a, a, a specific protocol, very simple protocol that is used to com establish communications for uplinks and downlinks. So this is showing the upstream, uh, upstream protocol. There's also a downstream protocol you're going to want to uh, be familiar with. But in the case of the downstream protocol, the gateway also opens the connection so that the NAT port is uh, return traffic is open. The, the, the gateway sends keep alives to keep that NAT session open on the firewall. More, it, uh, also interesting on the gateways is the metadata that can be added to the frames, that is added to the frames as they're sent from the gateway to the network server. So most of my work so far has been analyzing this metadata. So we're gonna call it metadata because it's not payload data. And you can see all the different types of things it can add. You know, what's the, what's the GPS location? Uh, what was the signal to noise ratio? What was the received signal strength indicator? Um, if we look at some examples, that helps. So here's something that came in this afternoon, right? Uh, 2.05, I must have been working on this today. Uh, it shows you the app endpoint user identifier and the device endpoint user identifier. Looks like I missed a carriage return there. It shows you the frame count. This frame counts are sequential. You should see all frames. I've learned recently the applications, sir, uh, the MQTT broker may not see all frames because some frames may be responses to downlinks, in which case there would be no frame forwarded on to the uh, MQTT broker or the application. So we have to account for, but we have an idea if there's big gaps in frames, what, does that mean we're losing frames because things are out of range? obstructions whatever or is it because the missing frames which i'll show you hopefully briefly are due to responses to downlinks uh, but you can see great metadata here what frequency did it come in at i'd like to start to do some analysis to make sure for example at smu they have 64 channel gateways we may find that the lower success rate um the lower uh, uh the the, low, the lower signal to noise ratio is happening on specific channels or specific subbands due to interference in the environment. So by having this data now having been collected for a month or more, I can start to go in and figure out how to do analytics against the data set as far as uh, maybe we could use it to find interference. Uh, what's how, how strong was it received and what was the signal to noise ratio? Signal to noise ratio 10 is pretty much perfect. And we see plenty of negatives also getting through. The position data is coming as static data programmed into the gateway or programmed against the gateway, let's say, in the radio access network. This this longitude and latitude is not coming from the end node itself. Okay, so that's the end node. And Dave tells me we're all cut up over here in the question space. So that was the, that was the uh, radio frequency gateways page, I'm sorry. Let, let's look at SEMTOR next. This is a, uh, the center of our solution. Uh, we can see this is the same diagram, part of the diagram I showed you earlier. SEMTOR has a relationship with the network server. SEMTOR is the application server we're using. You might use ChirpStack, which is also a network server and an application server. If you're doing a private deployment, 
you might use the things network. They have a network server and an application server that, and then they also have an MQTT broker where they post the data for you. Uh, in my case, we were using Exonus SEMTOR. I have a quite a few slides on this page that show you how to actually provision it. So I'll try to skip to those fairly quick. The key here is again, to understand that you will need to provision the device by defining its dev UI, app UI and app key if you're using over the air activation. That data will be pushed off to the LoRaWAN network server, technically to a, the join server function, so that the end nodes can device can can join. The end nodes also will either need to be programmed with that same data, or they're already programmed that way from the factory, like with the home sensor. Sorry, uh, with the Tectelic smart sensor, there already is a Dev UI, App UI, and App key that you can get from the vendor uh, that you can then program into. SEMTOR, which will then be pushed down to the LoRa network server so that that device can join. Important as well is to understand that it not only decrypts at the application layer, but it can also decode or just send on uh, non-decoded data to your application. Uh, multiple applications can be serviced here. Let's take a look at some of this stuff. We've talked through a bunch of it. In the case of SEMTOR, I have a list of applications, just like with the Things Network. The, with the Things Network, I'm going to define my gateways, and I'm going to define my applications, and then I'm going to assign devices to the applications. In the case of SEMTOR, we don't see the gateways here. They're configured somewhere else. But we do see the applications. So you're going to start with the application, define your application. In my case, I was at this point, I was sending it to a private MQTT broker in my house. The reason I was using Mosquito from Eclipse. Uh, the reason is, um, well, I wanted to. <laughs> the the uh, it, it also supports uh, authentication, right? So the using HiveMQ, you put your data up there and anyone can see it. I started using topic slash v one dot six slash devices slash dev UI like this because I was working with UBIDOTS. Later I learned that was an UBIDOTS thing, the V1.6. So most of my topics are named something like slash AEX or slash SMU slash devices. So the first part indicates the customer, then slash devices, and then a variable named dollar sign dev UI forces the topic to have the name matching the endpoint. Makes it easier to track it, especially if you're only looking at the MQTT broker itself. Uh, I'm telling it to decode the data and that is associated with my organization. And so after you define very simple definition, where's my MQTT broker? In the case of SEMTOR, it could be sent to uh, Amazon DynamoDB. I presume that's something like Mongo. Um, I like my data in structured text. So uh, uh, having the data decoded by SEMTOR means I can I can structure the data and store it before it's stored. And SEMTOR devices. Okay, so now we have an application. I need to define my device. Here's my definition of ABD Fruit 3. I just say who my vendor is. I say what its profile is. That's how it knows how to decode it, how SEMTOR knows how to decode it. I put it in my organization. I define where it will send data to. And you can see in this example, it's actually sending it to a different application. It's sending it to HiveMQ. I'm setting it to active, and I'm stating that it's in mobile. More uh, very important is this stuff down below, over the air activation, those three critical per device settings that we've been talking about. If you don't have a handy 16 byte, 128 um, bit encryption key, you can go somewhere like this, and it'll generate one for you. Or 10. Okay. So busy slide coming up. Get ready. The SEMTOR, the, 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 this section here that you're looking at in the main part of the window is actually the uh, Arduino log, serial log, showing me a little bit of the data that it's reading. It's showing me that it completed a transmission. It's showing me what the payload itself was structured like in this case. 0300316, so I can look at that and decode it myself and say, yes, my encoding is working correctly. And then it transmits it and it comes back and says, I've, 
I've completed the transmission, which means it's also completed waiting for the receive window. So it is sending frames, it looks like every one minute. And then at the top, barely readable, in MQTT Explorer, the data is received. And then over on the right, also in MQTT Explorer, the data is in a decoded state due to SEMTOR having decoded it for us. So that means we can see the temperature, we can see the input tension, the analogic input tension, et cetera. Okay, so that's the SEMTOR page. Looks like my network server page is in the wrong order here. We were going to talk a little bit more about the network server. Okay, this is a slide I was looking for earlier. Here, this this slide shows you your uh, encryption keys, right? You have a network session key between the end device and the network server, and you have an application session key between the end device and the application server. What else did we miss by not seeing this page? Also in the network server, on the right-hand side, another busy slide, I can go and look at the frame log. This frame log on this network server, you typically wouldn't get to see because you're not the network operator. But as I have access to log in at every net as a network operator, I can see this very um, helpful information telling me, well, for one, I can see that if I follow this column here, I'm not missing any uplinks. If I look at the next column to the right, I can see that it is hopping around as I'd expect to. It looks like uh, channel two. No, uh, sorry. It must. Be, it's not, the reason it's jumping is, is it's, not, it's it's using four channels out of subband one and four channels out of subband uh, two. I can see the received signal strength and the signal to noise ratio they're coming in at, what data rate they're moving at, what timestamps they have. Over on the left-hand side, again, I'm trying to show that, you know, these frames are coming in and being decoded as seen in MQTT Explorer, but I can see them also on the right here as they came through the network server. So that could be very helpful to know that your frames are being received and all of them and what their strengths are. Here's another example of what I can see in, in the every net network server. This device has not joined the network. I can see that SEMTOR has pushed down to it the dev UI and the app UI, but it has yet, and the app key, but it has yet to set a device address or the two session keys. Under over the air activation, it shows that it's never joined. A couple of things I've discovered re regarding every net. It's going to, most of your devices are going to show up here as, as US 902.928, and I'm, that's not the right channel plan. You need to change it to 902.928 AB. This is only for every net. Right, so you need to make sure that they, they match. Your channel plan that your gateways are using need to match the channel plan that you're gonna tell the device to use. Similar, if I don't turn on adaptive data rate, these channel maps will not be sent down to the device. Here's a final look at more uplinks. This, again, look from coming from a Tectelic smart sensor. What I like to see here is I'm not missing any frames. What I'm interested in though is why am I only using the 500 kilohertz channel, right, 903.0? I don't have an answer for that. But I do know that, you know, that's probably better off using 125 kilohertz channels and, and jumping around. As a matter of fact, I thought you were supposed to jump around. These transmissions are only coming in once an hour, probably more often because I'm using my, um, I might be using my magnet to activate it. Okay, so that's the every net page, the network server page. And the last part of this journey of our data from N, yeah. Uh, a last part of our journey from our end node is to get the data into a database where people can look at it. So that's what I've tried to capture here on data store page. Data storage, we are going to collect it with node red from an MQTT broker, and we're going to store it in Influx. I tried to use Grafana to look at the data. It didn't give me what I wanted right away because I wanted to look for missing frames. So I wrote some Python using Jupyter Pi Notes or whatever, Jupyter Notebook, and then converted that into a Django project at no small effort. So now I can see my 
RSSI and SSR, SNR and frame count data, but I can't actually see my temperatures yet. So let's look at this content a little bit. Um, the, the first thing you want to do is use MQTT Explorer to look for your data, to see if you can see your data coming in at the MQTT broker. Use MQTT Explorer to subscribe to the same topic that SEMTOR is publishing to, or that your um, application server is publishing to. Using MQTT Explorer on your desktop, you can also even graph things. If I find that thing like soil moisture value zero, click and click, I get a graph over here, and it's gonna start showing me uh, the graph over time. You can see at the top here, I have two topics for the two different devices, and I'm only looking at the A4C device. However, you can't really store your data in MQTT Explorer. That's just a, a desktop application. As soon as you close your desktop, it's gonna stop collecting data. So it's no good for anybody else. So you really wanna store it in something like Influx. Now, Influx DB is a time series database. They recently went to version two. I'm stuck to version 1.7 because I'm a newbie. And I found it pretty easy to work with. I managed to get Influx DB and Node Red running both off something called MCCI IoT dashboard. MCCI IoT dashboard. Although I think I took a fork and had to make some changes to it. This is a Docker stack of an Apache server, a Node-RED server, an Influx database, and then I'm not using the backup system or the post fix at this point. Grafana didn't go so well for me. Again, I, I think it did offer lots of value, but it wasn't just the data I was looking for off the bat, which is I was looking for missed frames. So that is a very interesting product that um, I'd be happy to help you get it up and running as well. It, there are some components of it that are a little out of date that needed to be updated to work with Docker. And I haven't uh, tried to push those back to the vendor yet. Let's see. But ultimately, once you get in there, you can open up with SSH into a command line connected. I have a, you know, a shortcut on my Linux host that I just jump into Influx with. And next thing you know, I can run queries like this. The queries aren't that different than you'd expect from uh, SQL, to me, they seem super simple. Select the fields I want, uh, tell it where I'm getting it from, tell it which device I want to look at. I can group by device. I can order by time descending and I can give it a limit. And look, I get, I get to see my last six frames from that device. And you can see there was a big gap here. It used to be coming up at frame. Zoom in my screen, okay. Just trying to get this a little larger for you. You can see there was a the frame counts were 24 and 25. And that was some time back, like on the 12th of December. And then I recently just put new batteries into these units for today's session. You can see the most recent frames I've received are four, six, seven, and eight. Now reading this data in um, text is not very uh, enjoyable. Uh, you can get a lot of value out of it, but you probably want to get it up onto some kind of a web interface. And so that's what I worked on next. But in order to move the data between, I'm gonna take that screen size down again. Okay, in order to move the data between HiveMQ and the Influx database, I'm using Node-RED. Let's take a look at that. Node-RED, I've really been looking forward to working with Node-RED for some time because even though I've done lots of programming in the last 30 something years um, at a somewhat hackish level, um, and, and I tend to like command line the most. Uh, I find that this is so powerful for the simple task I was trying to achieve, which is, is collect data, refactor it, and store it. A couple things you want to see here are these green options here are basically debugs with a little, little green tab on the right says it's enabled. And then I'm debugging the current flow over here. I'm on the I'm on the bug tab and I'm clicking on current flow. So I can see 
the data that's coming in from the MQTT broker. And then you see the data after I refactor it. So basically what's going in to be stored in Influx. And on the right here, some critical parts, as you see under ABD AEX out, oops, stop trying to do that, is that this is probably pretty tiny as well. Um, you had better put the first um, array element is payload data, let's say, fields. And then the second are the tagged parameters as Influx calls them. So if I don't put device and gateway in as tagged parameters, I can't group by them. So this is what I came up with in order to uh, allow you to you know, group by devices. It needs to be a tagged parameter. So that's the second set of objects that are passed to Influx DB for storage. How do I refactor it? So here's the same script, the same net uh, uh, node red flow. And I'm looking at what's called, known as a JSONator expression editor, which is being used in this refactor, AEVD, AEX refactor change node, as they call it. Uh, and you can see that on the right-hand side, it says what to go get payload.metadata.appui and assign it to the left-hand side, app UI. So for this data stream, I want to store my data always with, with these regular names that you see on the left-hand side. So I look at my data stream and I say, where in my data stream coming in from MQTT is that value? Well, I can get frequency from payload meta underscore data dot TX underscore info dot frequency. Further down, you can see some things that took me quite some time to solve. I can get panel temperature from payload.decoded underscore data dot ambient temperature 11 dot value. The hard part here was the spaces in the key name, ambient temperature 11. All you have to do is put single quotes around them and it works with them perfectly well. Okay, so that's node red doing an amazing service for us. And that's all I've got documented on the data storage. There was one more component that I would like to show off, which is I have, built, I have two versions of my Django application running right now, a development edition and a production edition. So if we go to the development edition, sure, why not? And I look at, for example, this add a fruit. The application comes up showing one week ago at the beginning of the day to the current time, click go. And using the power of matplotlib, I have a pretty graph. And then further down below, you can look at the raw data itself. For example, look, three frames on this time and one frame missed here because there's a gap in the sequence. So I can then go back and try to see if that was because of a downlink or in this case, it wasn't heard from, from 804 to 905. Well, it's supposed to report every 15 minutes. So this looks like it legitimately did miss three frames. Should have been an 819, an 834, and an 849. So not sure why those frames were lost. Uh, that was some a couple of days back. I'm not going to worry about it. Um, but that's how I keep an eye on the quality of these devices as far as how many frames are being received. For example, here is an Arduino field test device. And if I go to look at November 1st to December 1st to December 12th. You can see very few frames have been missed, um, especially since it looks like they turned it off on the 11th over on the right-hand side here. There was a gap here on the about the 4th. So if I look at this on a tighter range, like from the 5th, to the tenth, it says bark. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> okay, so in this time frame, I only missed uh, looks like two frames here. So here's a device that put out 1,688 frames, and I only lost two. Pretty good, pretty reliable, but also interesting that it's it's uh, RSSI, which is green is jumping all over the place between negative 80 and negative 120. 
So I'm not sure what they're doing with that device. If it's being moved around, I'm not sure what its antenna orientation is. I do know that it seems to be a lot more reliable than some of the other devices we've seen at the site. So again, uh, you're looking for some help getting some web interface onto your data, let me know. Uh, this is a starting point. My goal next would be to uh, start graphing temperature and battery, as at least one of these sensors is running down my battery, and I'd rather prove that with a graph. And so that is the run of today's presentation. Quite a bit of content. I don't know if we have anybody left on the YouTube channel. Dave, how'd we do? Uh, are there any questions left? There are not any questions at the moment. Um, uh, Dave, do you think you might uh, uh, help us look into this question of Amazon Sidebar? Is that something we might want to look a little background on? Okay, well, that's all I have for today's uh, trip report. <laughs> I was hoping to spend a little more time developing the analogy of the ALF workshops and delivering packages for Santa, but I just spent all of my time creating content, so I think you did pretty good. Yeah, I think you did very good, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's going to bring us to an end for tonight. We're going to try to go ahead and uh, do this again next month. We are currently still looking for a presenter for January. So if anybody has anything or knows anyone who does, please reach out to us and uh, we'll get you on the calendar. Anybody else have anything? No, I think that just about covers it, Dave. Thanks. All right, awesome. Thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you everybody for coming tonight. Have a great holiday, and we'll see you next month. All right. Have a great day. Merry Christmas.